Five, in three, two, one. We are live. <laughs> Welcome to the first ever Spark Fun Live. Uh, today we're going to be building a project and uh, we'll also be watching your comments uh, in the comment section uh, to the side of the video. So if you have any questions, um, then we're going to have one of our engineers, Mike, uh, try to take care of your questions. And if they're directed at me, we'll try to get them uh, written on a card and passed over here so that I can answer your questions. And hopefully, um, we'll get everybody through this build. Um, I posted a wish list on our website of all the parts that you're going to need to put this together. So um, hopefully, you've gotten all of that stuff shipped to you. Um, if you don't have the parts, uh, feel free to just follow along and watch. We will have this recorded on our YouTube page. So uh, if you are subscribed to us, come back, check out our videos later, and you'll be able to watch this again later when you have the parts with you and follow along. Um, and also, just feel free to hang out and ask questions and um, just sort of be part of uh, Spark Fun Live. So this is what we're going to be building today. It's called an optotheremin. It's sort of similar to uh, a musical instrument called the theremin, um, which was famous for being an electronic instrument that you play without touching it. Um, uh, originally, it worked by interacting with radio waves around these antennae that stuck out of the box. Um, and in this version, instead of using radio waves, we use light, which is why it's called an optotheremin and not uh, just a theremin. And um, usually you see these made with like a photo cell or some really simple light sensor. And I've decided that I wanted a little bit more control over the sound, so I used one of our infrared distance sensors instead. Um, you do not have to put it in like a little cube enclosure. I just happen to have uh, access to the laser cutter here, so I made this box. Um, but you can put this in anything. And actually, I think today um, I may end up building this into a foam pumpkin that I have sitting here. So um, it's a little late to carve pumpkins, but, um, but it's more festive than uh, sort of a cardboard box that's laying around. So um, let's talk about the parts that go into this, and then we can start the build. On the wish list, uh, you'll notice that the whole thing sort of revolves around the SparkFun breadboard. Um, the breadboard is our Arduino. It's sort of an Arduino Uno uh, clone. And we use them in education because uh, they don't change very often. We can control when this revs. So, um, uh, so educators can get a hold of these and they know they won't change for a while. Um, and we like them here because uh, they're a little less expensive. And um, it's the same form factor as all the other uh, Arduino components. So it's shield compatible and everything. I like to use them uh, in my builds because they have a barrel jack on them for the power um, so that you can plug our four AA battery holder directly into the Arduino. So um, that's sort of the heart of the project, our Arduino controller and our four AA battery holder. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be modulating the sound of our optotheremin using a sharp IR sensor. This is our short range sharp sensor. So this one has a, uh, has a range of, of up to, I think, like 30 centimeters. So it's a short range sensor, which is nice because uh, if you're playing this instrument, you want to be able to turn these knobs as well as sort of move your hand in front of the sensor. Um, you could use probably the normal uh, sharp sensor, the mid-range one, and it would be fine. If you use the long-range sensor, it may take some teamwork to, uh, to play your instrument. But if that's what you're into, um, those sensors will be interchangeable. Those, so you could use uh, any of those three parts, uh, wire it, program it the same way. Um, you would just get a different sort of distance range. Um, to make this easier to hook up, we actually have this wiring harness available. And I put this on the wish list too. Um, you can solder directly to these. Uh, as you can see, it has a JST connector on the part. And you can sort of solder onto the lugs where that JST connector uh, uh, is connected to the board. But if you, um, if you do that, it can be a little fragile. Uh, it can be a pain to get this JST connector off. So uh, we like to use these. These just snap right in to the sensor. 
and then you've got these nice long leads that you can uh, then strip and then solder to your project. So, uh, what else do we have? We have the speaker. This is our uh, smallest speaker. It's a little thin eight ohm uh, speaker that we you might see in like a like a talking greeting card or something like that. Um, it's not very loud. It's hard to get a lot of sound out of this. But um, I think uh, after playing with this instrument for a couple minutes, you'll agree that it's loud enough. Uh, if you want to get more annoying with it, you can use a larger speaker. The Arduino can drive a, a fairly big speaker, so um, uh, th we do carry a few different sizes. There's an 8 ohm speaker that we carry that's probably about that big around. It's a, it's a little bit larger than this and a little louder. Um, going any bigger than that, like our new two and a half inch or four inch speaker drivers, may be, may, that may be getting out of hand, but, uh, but feel free to give it a go uh, if that's what you have on hand. And then uh, we have these two potentiometers. And they look identical, but actually uh, these are different parts. One of these is a linear potentiometer that we will use as an input device uh, to actually change some parameters in the code. So this will change either the, the type of sound that we're making or it'll change some, uh, some parameter of the sound. Uh, so the microcontroller is actually going to read the position of this potentiometer, whereas this one uh, is not linear. This is actually a logarithmic uh, potentiometer. And, and the reason that we're going to use this is uh, because that's how our hearing works. So this is going to be our volume knob. And you actually want uh, this style of potentiometer instead of a linear pot, because with a linear pot, what you would find is that um, it would not, as you turned the volume knob, the sound wouldn't scale the way that you expect it to in your head. Um, so we're going to wire this up uh, on our audio output uh, between the audio output on the Arduino and our speaker to actually change the volume of the instrument. So the microcontroller won't even know that this is there. And then we've got, of course, some knobs for the potentiometers just to make the project pretty and to make them a little easier uh, to change. And these guys are actually our GTE or goes to 11 knobs. And uh, they do indeed go from 0 to 11. So, uh, oh, and of course, since we have a 4 AA battery holder, you're going to want 4 AA batteries. I've just got some of our alkaline uh, batteries. You can use rechargeables if you want to. It doesn't really matter. Um, but that's probably going to be the easiest way to power your project. So uh, now that we've got all our parts here, let's talk uh, briefly about the tools that you're going to need to put this together. Um, everything that connects to the Arduino, um, we're going to use uh, solid core wire to do that. And that's because you can actually strip the end of the solid core wire down and just stick it into the female headers on the Arduino. And it'll kind of stay put and make a decent connection. If you try to do that with stranded wire, you'll have to um, tin it first with a little bit of solder. Just put a little solder on your iron and sort of um, wipe it onto the end of your stranded core. And that way, uh, it'll be stiff enough that you can actually get it into these headers. Um, so don't panic if all you have on hand is stranded wire. That'll work fine. Um, but I'm going to use solid core. Um, and we will also need a couple of wire tools. I've just got some diagonal cutters that'll help me uh, snip parts off uh, down close to the board. So kind of a flush cut um, snips. And then just some needle nose pliers. I like these. They're a good multi-use uh, tool. Um, you can use them to sort of twist the ends off of uh, wires that you don't need. And also, they've got uh, cutting um, blades in there as well. So um, I tend to strip wire with pliers uh, just because I've always done that. But if you have wire strippers on hand, feel free to use those. Um, it's much easier. Um, and then finally, I've got our screwdriver set, but I'll probably only be using the uh, little tiny flathead screwdriver um, just to adjust the, um, so the way these knobs work is they have a little grub screw that sort of eats into the side of the potentiometer shaft to hold it in place. And so you'll need a little, almost like an eyeglass screwdriver, a little flathead that'll fit in there so that you can tighten that down. Um, and that should be the only thing that you need a screwdriver for um, in this whole project, except for maybe if you want to screw these parts into an enclosure of some kind. Um, so I don't need this whole set, but this is what I had on my desk, and this works great. So um, flathead screwdriver. And then also, you will want a soldering iron. 
Um, I've got one of our HACO soldering irons here. Um, a basic soldering station will work, or even like a little um, uh, soldering wand that you plug into the wall. Um, we're not going to be doing anything really exact today. In fact, we won't be soldering to any uh, pads today. We're only going to be soldering to these tabs on the pots, and then we'll also be twisting some wires together and soldering them. Uh, and then you can cover those with shrink tube or tape uh, for, in the interest of, of kind of moving things along today, uh, I'm just going to use masking tape to, to tape wires so that they don't uh, cause shorts, uh, accidentally connect with wires around them. Um, and then finally, I have a hot glue gun uh, just to kind of uh, get everything into the enclosure that we're going to use. You don't have to use hot glue. You can use tape or, or epoxy or whatever you have on hand. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for the hot glue because I think I've got, uh, yeah, here, got this festive foam pumpkin that uh, this is going to end up in. So uh, I thought hot glue is probably the, the way to go with this. Oh, and if you're going to hack it into something like this uh, that's not really uh, meant to be an electronics enclosure, you're probably going to want some tools to carve into these things. Um, I, ha I carry a, uh, I've got a knife, like a box cutter that I'll use. Um, but uh, we've got, uh, you could also use, I mean, if you have a Dremel on hand or like a handsaw or something like that, that could come in handy. All right. So, um, Ultimately, uh, uh, when we finish putting the hardware together, uh, you will have to connect this to your computer, of course, and write a little bit of Arduino code, and we will take you through that. Um, so be ready to do that. Uh, if you have a, uh, uh, your, make sure you have a USB cable, a mini USB cable to hook up your Arduino uh, to your computer so that you can follow along with the code as well. So now that we have all of the parts uh, set up here, and uh, my soldering iron's all heated up and everything, I think we can actually start the build. Um, and actually, before I start soldering things together here, I'm just going to plug in this, uh, this one that you might recognize from our promo video um, and just give you an idea of how it's working uh, so that you'll have sort of a picture in your head of what this thing's going to look like when you're finished. So I can modulate the uh, pitch of the sound by moving my end here. And I can change sort of the speed of how fast that note changes by turning this knob. And this is like uh, six, 12 lines of Arduino code, maybe. It's a very simple sketch. And then, of course, this knob, uh, as we discussed earlier, changes the uh, volume. So uh, let's see. Let me unplug that guy. And uh, we will get started hooking things up. So uh, I think the first thing that we should probably do is connect our uh, 10K potentiometer to the analog input on the Arduino. So I'm just going to kind of clear my workspace here. And um, uh, we'll probably just start by putting some long wire leads on this potentiometer. If you know what enclosure this is going to go into, um, then you might want to kind of choose the length of your wires accordingly so that you know that uh, they'll make the stretch from wherever this is to wherever the microcontroller is going to sit. Uh, as for me, I'm just going to kind of wing it. I'm going to cut some, some wire here, all the same length for the potentiometer, and then wire it up. And uh, um, however it fits into that foam pumpkin is how it's going to ultimately go. So uh, you want three pieces of wire for the three terminals on the potentiometer. And uh, what we're going to end up doing is setting up the potentiometer as a voltage divider, uh, which is a simple way of reading the position of the potentiometer using the microcontroller. Oh. All right, uh, let's see. So I'm just using pliers to uh, strip both ends of this wire. Um, if you have wire strippers, that's probably the way you want to go. And 
And then I'm just going to hook uh, each one around one of the solder lugs on our potentiometer. Again, double check that, you're, uh, that you've got the right one, because if, if you don't have the linear one here, um, you're going to run into a lot of trouble. And actually, now that I look at this, I have the wrong one. Uh, the linear one is going to say uh, B10K on the, on the front here. There's a little silk screen marking on it. Um, and then the one that we're going to use as a volume knob says C103 on it. So make sure you have the one that says B10K. And I'll just sort of, uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking the end of the wire and I'm using the needle nose pliers to put a little hook on it. And then I'm hooking that through the solder lug on the potentiometer and then crimping it down using the pliers. And that'll hold the wire in place uh, until I, I actually come and uh, put a little bit of solder on it. All right. Now that I've got the wire sort of hooked there, I'm just going to kind of set it up to, uh, to where I can get to all the lugs and then get my soldering iron here and put down a little bit of solder on each of those solder lugs. I'm kind of assuming that uh, if you're following along that you've soldered before, but if you haven't, um, the technique here is pretty simple. Um, you want to uh, make sure the tip of your soldering iron is clean. You'll have a brass sponge or, or a uh, wet uh, sponge that you can wipe the tip off. And then uh, take a little bit of solder and just put it on the end of your soldering iron just to transfer the heat from your iron to the part. And then lay that little blob of solder on the part to heat it up. And don't be afraid to let it get uh, pretty hot before you start feeding solder in. Uh, and you want the solder to melt on the part and not on the iron. The part should be hot enough to actually melt the solder. And um, you'll know when you've got enough solder because you'll have a, just a little bit of a bump there. Um, you don't want, you know, too much solder isn't a terrible problem uh, with things like this because we're not working with a lot of parts that are real close together. Um, but if you don't have enough solder, um, that can be hard to track down once you've finished the project because it may not make a great connection all the time. So now that I have the potentiometer uh, soldered to these wire tails, um, I'm just going to set that to the side right now. Um, uh, uh, ultimately, this will connect to the microcontroller, but I think for now uh, I want to get all the um, soldering out of the way, and then we'll go back and connect everything back to the Arduino. The next uh, trick is going to be to um, tin the ends of these wires that come off of our sharp infrared sensor. Um, like I was talking about before, I like to use solid core wire to connect to these female headers. Um, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, really, this connector is stranded. The stranded wire makes it more flexible. It's a little easier uh, to work with, but it, it's not very easy to stick into these um, female headers. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to strip a little bit of the insulation off the ends of each of these wires, and then I'm going to twist them uh, uh, as tight as I can just using uh, my fingertips and then put a little bit of solder on them uh, just to stiffen them up so that you can get them into the um, female headers on the Arduino. If you have uh, an Arduino Pro or a Pro Mini, it'll have, um, it'll have uh, vias around the outside instead of these female headers. And then uh, in that case, you'll just be connecting these wires the same way we did uh, with the potentiometer. You'll just make a little hook, hook it through the, uh, through the, uh, the header on the Arduino, and then put a little bit of solder on top of it. Um, so I'm just twisting up these wires, and then I'm going to put a little bit of solder on each of them. You don't want too much because you don't want to make it too fat to fit into the connectors on the Arduino. Um, you just need just enough to, to stiffen it up so you're not trying to push um, this, this big mess of stranded wire into these uh, connectors. 
if this is uh, if this is some a project that you're building that's going to get kind of tossed around, uh, then you you probably do want to use a pro or a pro mini uh, or something that doesn't have the female headers on it, so that you can actually solder these to your Arduino. Because um, if this is if this is handled, uh, you know, roughly, then it's it's basically gonna uh, you're gonna get some loose wires, but. Um, for a short project like this, uh, I like to do it this way. And then if I get tired of this noisemaker, then I can pull all those wires out and reuse the Arduino. So uh, now you can see I've tinned the ends of these wires. And uh, oh, that one's got a little bit of solder still on. It's kind of sharp. Let me fix that. There we go. I've tinned the ends of each of these wires so they're, uh, they're less flexible. And uh, as you can see, I can push them down into the header on the Arduino, and they they stick in there, and that's what you want. Um, if you've got them, if you've got too much solder on there, and they're a little uh, a little too fat to fit into the header, um, take your iron and just kind of smooth it out and pull some of that solder off of there. Um, the great thing about solder is that you can reheat it, remelt it uh, as many times as you need to to get it right. So now that we've done that, we'll set that to the side. And we will uh, get our volume, what's ultimately going to be our volume uh, knob. And we'll go ahead and um, put some of our wire on that guy. And uh, again, I'm, I'm picking sort of an arbitrary wire length. And uh, I'm going to make it work at the end. If you have plans for where this thing's going to go, then you may want to be more calculating than I am. Again, same way we did with the uh, linear potentiometer. Uh, just take three pieces of wire and strip uh, on either side, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch on either side or less. You don't need to, you don't need a whole lot of bare wire sticking out on either end. making a mess. All right. And now, just like last time, we'll take our needle nose pliers and just make a little hook on the end of the wire, put it through the solder lug on the potentiometer, and then um, just crimp that down. And do that with all three here. solder on each of those. If I'm, uh, if I'm going too fast for the majority of you, uh, you'll let Mike know on the comments and, uh, and uh, so that I can slow down. I think we're moving at a pretty brisk pace here, but um, I want to make sure that we all get this thing done. All right. A little bit of solder on the end of the iron here, and use that to heat up the part. Introduce a little bit more solder and make a little clean little solder joint here. Uh, if you want to do this project, uh, if you want to do kind of clean up some of these solder joints and, and make it a little more presentable. Um, before we connect the other ends of these wires, you can put some, some shrink tube on these and slide it down to the end here and then, uh, and then heat it up and it'll shrink around that solder joint and um, it'll make it a little bit more, uh, uh, it'll make it a little nicer looking and probably a little bit more robust. Um, but because these solder lugs are connected like directly to the part, uh, I'm not too worried about like a short circuit, for instance. Uh, I don't think any of these wires are going to bend so violently that they'll uh, actually touch each other there. So, all right. So that is our volume knob, and uh, the way that this is connected, um, 
we can actually go ahead and connect one side to our speaker. Um, so what this is going to do ultimately is act a lot like the linear potentiometer does. Um, it will also be a voltage divider, but the incoming voltage will actually be um, uh, our signal, our audio signal, and the uh, output will go to the speaker. So the speaker's acting sort of like the uh, analog input on our Arduino. So we're going to send the line level or the uh, audio level to one side of the potentiometer. The other side will go to ground, and then that center tap will go to the speaker. And as you turn this, the speaker, the voltage that comes to the speaker will either be closer to our ground voltage uh, or closer to ground, so it'll be closer to zero volts, or it'll be closer to our audio level. Um, which is going to be our max volume. So uh, we can actually take um, our center tap on the, uh, make sure you have the pot that says C103 on it. We can take the center tap on that and actually go ahead and solder that to our speaker. Uh, these speakers, unfortunately, the, the little wire leads that come on them can be sort of fragile. So I like to replace those and just solder directly to the, um, to the pads on the speaker. Um, so that's what we're going to do. I'm just going to pick uh, the positive side of the speaker here. I'm going to heat up that solder, pull this wire off, and replace it with the center tap on this potentiometer. We have a question. Uh, Benzibo, Benzibo asks, uh, as retired science teacher, did you tinker and make things as a kid? Uh, I did, actually. Thank you. Um, so I grew up, uh, my dad is a uh, woodworker. He's a mechanical engineer. And uh, now he works sort of as a, he's a project manager for a, a grocery store chain, actually. But uh, he, his degree is in mechanical engineering. So he was always tinkering and doing things when I was growing up in the house. And we had a big wood shop in the basement, so I had access to tools and, and uh, was allowed to play with power tools from a very early, a dangerously early age, um, which I highly recommend. Like, supervised uh, power tool time is great for kids. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to really influence kids to be interested in, in tinkering and playing with things like that. But I do know if they show an interest, um, that, that all you can really do is, is enable that. So my parents were really great about that. Um, and so yeah, I was always, uh, you know, I hurt myself a lot in the, in the shop growing up playing with power tools and stuff and learned a lot of great lessons from that. So yeah, definitely. I was definitely uh, tinkering and playing with stuff as a kid. I had, you know, Legos and Kinects and all that stuff too, which is great. Um, Ah, yeah, so we're going to take the positive side here and heat that up with some solder. That was a great question. Thanks for that. And heat that up, pull that wire right off, get rid of that, and take that center, center tap on that. And uh, actually, probably what you want to do is take a little bit of solder and put it on that wire before you connect it. Uh, and then sit that on top of the pad and heat the wire until it's hot enough to melt onto the speaker pad. And there you go. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, if this project needs to be a little more robust, you might put a little bit of hot glue on top of that connection um, because what you're going to end up with is that if this wire gets pulled, it'll actually pull the pad off of the speaker. So, um, you know, it depends on what you're mounting this into, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of putting things together in a, in a way that if handled gingerly, it'll be fine. Um, but if you're going to put this in a kid's hands, you might put a little hot glue on that connection because um, kids will tear stuff up, which is great. They should, but uh, kids get sad when they break their toys. Uh, now, the other side of the speaker, we'll go ahead and deal with that. I'm just going to put a piece of, of uh, solid wire on that. Um, the other side of the speaker will go to ground. Um, so let's see. We'll cut a piece. Uh, again, I'll cut an arbitrary length of our solid core wire, and 
um, solder it on there. So I'm just going to go ahead and heat up this, the other pad on the speaker and pull the wire off. And we will replace it with a length of this hookup wire. There we go. And uh, just like the other wire that we connected to our speaker, we probably want to take a little bit of solder and just uh, put it on the end of this wire. I really should have a clamp or a third hand or something here, but uh, I'm just going to... Uh, there we go. And then you can sit that wire down on the pad here and heat it up until the solder melts. And there it goes. Solid connection to the speaker. Awesome. So I do now have a third hand, uh, which may actually not come in handy anymore now that I'm looking around. We may be done with that. but. Um, okay, so at this point in the project, what you, we should have is uh, one potentiometer that says B10K on it with uh, three pieces of wire soldered to it. We should have our sharp IR sensor with the JST connector plugged in and with the ends of the wire tinned. And then we should have uh, the other potentiometer, the one that says C103 on it. Uh, with a piece of wire coming off either side and then the center wire connected to the positive side of our speaker. If it's connected to the negative side, no one's going to notice. It'll be fine. Um, and then the other side uh, will have a piece of wire on it that will go to ground. So this is what you should have so far. And now we can actually connect them to our controller. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're using the SparkFun Redboard as our controller. And uh, we have two analog inputs, right? So our uh, IR sensor simply outputs a voltage um, from 0 to 5 volts that corresponds to the uh, distance to the, to the nearest object. And so that'll be read by the what's called the ADC, or the analog to digital converter on our Arduino. And then uh, we'll do the same thing with the potentiometer. The potentiometer will be connected to ground and to 5 volts, um, acting as a voltage divider. It'll output a voltage between 0 and 5, which will correspond to what position the knob is uh, uh, in. So um, that'll be an analog input as well. And then we will have an output, which will be the sound to the speaker. And that output will go to one side of our voltage uh, potentiometer, or, or our volume potentiometer, sorry. Um, so I guess first we'll connect the sharp IR sensor. Uh, that is going to want a power connection and a ground connection. And then the yellow wire on this is the signal, so that'll go to the analog input. So I'm just going to plug the red wire here into the, uh, it says 5 volts on the controller here. And it's, it's 5V, and it's right beside where it says ground. There's a little power strip here. You have another question. All right. Uh, Chris L456 asks, what temperature is your soldering iron set to? Um, so I'm using, uh, it depends. The temperature that you want to use kind of depends on what solder, what type of solder you're using. Leaded solder will melt at a lower temperature than lead-free solder. Um, I tend to keep my, so I use lead-free solder. This is our lead-free solder that we sell um, from the website. Um, I use the thinner, the thinner uh, style of the lead-free solder. It melts at a fairly high temperature. I think you can probably work with it from um, uh, 650. And uh, forgive me, but I, I don't know what, if that's 650C or if that's, do you know the Hakko irons? It's Fahrenheit, 650 Fahrenheit. Um, so I keep my, my uh, Hakko set to 750. Uh, I just crank it 
like all the way up uh, because I, I tend to solder fairly quickly. Um, if you're quick and you know that you're not going to apply too much heat to the parts, um, then you can really crank the temperature up and it's not going to hurt anything. If you're um, uh, fairly new to soldering, I suggest keeping the temperature right above where your solder is going to melt so that you can sort of spend your time on each solder joint and not worry about getting things too hot. Um, so 650 is probably a good temperature, but mine is set to 750. Um, and actually, now that we've talked about soldering, uh, we may not be done soldering here. Uh, I just realized we have uh, two different parts that are going to want to be connected to the 5 volt line on our Arduino. So, um, and because we're connecting everything into the headers on the redboard, we're going to just want one wire that goes to the 5 volt uh, header. So, uh, what we probably should do is take the power line on the sharp IR sensor and take one side of our linear potentiometer. Um, it doesn't matter which side, one side's going to go to ground, one side's going to go to 5 volts. You can just choose one, um, as long as it's not the center. And then uh, uh, twist those guys together. And then I'm going to take another length of our solid core wire and solder that to those two so that I just have one that's coming down to our Arduino. Um, this, isn't the, uh, this isn't the way that I would build something if it was going to be permanent, but this is a good way to kind of get everything put together. Um, I know some of you are probably shaking your heads. Like, oh, why is, he, why is he soldering all this stuff together just to plug it into the headers on the Arduino? And uh, I realize it's a little goofy, but, um, but I think it's probably the easiest way to get this project done, especially when I've got so many people uh, working on this at the same time, and I don't know where everyone's skill level is, and I don't necessarily want to try to solder to the pads on, say, the Pro Mini, uh, where you have lots of headers close together. So. I think this is a pretty good compromise. Uh, I'm going to take, I've just, I've just taken a length of my solid core wire and I've stripped, uh, I've stripped both sides of it and I'll just take that and twist it up with our other two power, our uh, 5 volt lines here. And uh, I'm going to use my third hand that I've got here. Clamp that all in here so that I can uh, use both my hands to solder. I'm just going to put a little bit of solder on the end of this. Um, again, after you've put some solder on uh, wire connections like this, you want to cover them either with uh, a little bit of heat shrink tubing or a little bit of tape. Um, what you don't want is to just leave it exposed like this where uh, you have a big glob of conductive uh, uh, material sort of flopping around on the inside of your project because uh, it'll make it very easy for that to rest against another part and cause a short circuit. Or maybe not even a short circuit, maybe just weird, weird behavior, you know, maybe it'll tie a voltage line to, a, to an analog input so that your sensor doesn't work right. Um, basically any unexpected behavior is a, is a bad thing. <laughs> So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, in the interest of, uh, of making this move along, I'm just going to use a little bit of tape uh, instead of shrink tube. And I'm just going to wrap it around the end of the wire here, just to keep it from shorting against uh, other stuff and causing that unexpected behavior. All right, so there's our consolidated power line there, and uh, we'll go ahead and plug that into where it says 5V, and that's uh, the fourth header down from, from VN, from the end of the, of the power strip here on the Arduino, uh, or on the redboard. <coughs> okay, now, the next step is going to be to connect all of our grounds. Um, luckily, the redboard has multiple ground headers, um, because uh, ground is... is uh, you're going to have a lot of things connected to that because ultimately every part of the circuit returns to ground. Um, sometimes ground is known as common um, because it is sort of the common uh, place where the, where the end of the circuit is. So if you think about sort of conventional current flow, uh, you'll have current coming from the 5 volts and ending up at ground. Uh, 
So uh, let's start with the sensor. The ground line on the sensor is going to be the black one. And uh, you can go ahead and just plug that into where it says GND, which is uh, uh, short for ground. Just plug that in on the breadboard. And make sure there's not too much. If you've stripped uh, the wire back too far, you're going to have uh, bare wire sort of hanging out on the side of the breadboard here. Uh, if you've got it hanging out too far to where it looks like it might, it might swivel over and lay on top of another exposed wire, um, go ahead and pull that out, trim it back a little bit, and stick it back in there. Um, you just want to avoid uh, short circuits, uh, especially right here where you've got ground and power right next to each other. Um, you could cause a short there and, and possibly burn up the voltage regulator on your breadboard. So. Um, and now, actually, since we have both sides of our, of our infrared sensor hooked up, uh, we can go ahead and hook up the analog line, and we'll have that uh, completely connected. So um, it doesn't matter which analog input that you connect this to, um, but just so we're all on the same page, I'm going to go ahead and connect mine to A0. So take the yellow line, the last remaining line on your sharp IR sensor, and connect that to A0. All right, so now our infrared sensor is completely connected. And we'll move along to the, uh, to the linear pot, which is what we're going to use to modulate the, uh, some aspect of our sound, either the delay or pitch or something. So uh, what you should have is one side of that already connected uh, to the power line that we, that we soldered together earlier. And we're going to take the other side of that, so not the center, but the, whatever the side opposite of the power is, and uh, go ahead and connect that to ground. And there should be another ground pin open right beside uh, where we plugged in the last ground line. And then the center of this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is actually another analog input. Uh, so we can go ahead and put that into, I'm going to put it into A1, just to have those side by side. Uh, again, you can plug it in wherever you want, but um, if you're following along, go ahead and put that one into A1, and that way, when we write the code, um, we'll all be on the same page. And then finally, uh, the Arduino has everything it needs to uh, talk to the sensors, but to get any sound out of it, we're going to need to connect our speaker and our volume knob. So I'm going to connect, uh, first I'm going to connect the speaker to uh, ground on the breadboard. Uh, and there's another ground open uh, on the, beside pin 13. It's between 13 and a pin labeled A ref. And then uh, one side of your, again, it doesn't matter which side, but one side of your volume knob is going to connect to uh, really any digital pin will work for this. It's going to be the tone output. We're going to use what's called the tone library to generate the sound. Um, and you can use almost any pin, any digital pin on the board to do that, but uh, I've just chosen 9. Um, so I'm going to plug it into 9, and that's how we'll write the code. We'll write it for pin 9 as the output. And then you want to take your, uh, the other side of this potentiometer, and remember, we're creating a voltage divider that's, that's uh, outputting a voltage between the audio level and ground. So we want the other side of this to go to ground. Again, since we've used, there are uh, three uh, ground headers on the Arduino. Since we've used all of those, um, we can connect this to any other ground in our circuit. Um, if you're putting this into an enclosure and you know how everything's supposed to fit, you can just kind of choose the nearest component that has a ground line on it and solder to that. Um, I'm just going to take this straight up to the side of our speaker that's going to ground. I think that'll work fine. So. Uh, again, you can turn your speaker over and find which side is going to ground, and then just join this wire with it, and uh, I'll heat up the solder so that it flows onto that wire and, uh, and connect it together. helps if you put a little bit of solder on the end of your 
soldering iron to aid in uh, the heat transfer. And that is a complete circuit, aside from the power. Um, and we're not going to actually worry about the power right now because uh, all we're going to have to do is throw the batteries into this guy and then plug that into the barrel jack on the breadboard. Um, but since we're going to move on to programming now, uh, the board will get power from the USB connection while we're doing the programming. So we don't have to worry about hooking up the batteries right now. Um, we'll do that when we get to putting this into the enclosure. It looks like we've got another question. OSH Bots asks, what's the ETA for your pinball machine build? So if you've been watching uh, Engineering Roundtable, which is a series that we have on our uh, YouTube channel, then you'll know that I've been working on a pinball machine. Uh, I started it months ago now um, and I've actually built the cabinet for the machine and I've done some of the play field um, planning and actually uh, while I was on the national education tour uh, one of the uh, stops and I'll have to uh, I apologize because I can't remember uh, his name but uh, one of the guys who organized one of our education tour stops was nice enough to gi uh, give me an entire wedge head which is the um, the back of the pinball machine that has all the scoreboards in it to give me one of those out of an old electromechanical machine. So I actually have these really great electromechanical pinball parts uh, that I pulled out of that while we were on tour. I took this whole wedge and put it on the RV with us during the tour and took it to a hacker space and tore it down and then threw that all in some luggage and flew it back uh, from um, from Chicago back to uh, Denver so that I could use it in the pinball machine. So I've actually been collecting parts this whole time, um, but I haven't moved very much on the pinball machine itself. Uh, the next step will probably be to start prototyping the play field. So I'll just take a piece of, uh, of plywood or uh, OSB or something and start milling holes in it and just putting things in there and throwing balls around to see uh, how it sort of how it works and sort of get the layout right. Um, I really hope I'll be able to do that in the next couple of weeks and uh, we'll get a video out on that um, hopefully in January. Uh, I don't want to like put this on our video guy because uh, we don't have solid plans but I think probably he's giving me a thumbs up. I think probably in January we can get another video out. I want to have the pinball machine done uh, as almost sort of like a housewarming gift for our new office building. So uh, if you've been following our blog, you'll know that we're building a new uh, office, a new physical location for SparkFun. And we are hearing right now that we might be able to move in in uh, July or August. So uh, by then, I hope to have the machine done so that uh, we can put it in the new break room there and it'll be uh, sort, of a, sort of a housewarming gift. So yeah. Um, the next, I know it seems like a long stretch, but the next six months is my like sort of deadline. Uh, I'd like to get it done sooner than that, but we'll just sort of see how everything uh, works out. I've, of course, uh, I do a lot of the demos for the Friday New Product Post uh, projects, and I do um, some, some other tutorials on the website. So I've got uh, a lot of different projects going on right now, but that pinball machine has been, uh, it's actually sitting in my personal workshop at home. Uh, and it's uh, this huge thing that's sitting there, so I want to get it out of my shop. So uh, hopefully I'll get to work on it soon. Uh, thanks for asking. I'm glad people are still um, keeping an eye on that, and uh, I'm, I'm going to post an update hopefully very soon. So look for a new video maybe uh, towards the end of January, after the holidays. So um, now I think we're ready to move on to programming. Uh, so I've got um, my laptop here set up with... Arduino, and I think my computer's gone to sleep here. Once I get logged in, I will be able to show you guys what's going on on my screen.
Okay, so we've got uh, uh, Arduino opened up here. I'm not sure which version I'm using. Probably, oh, okay, I've got 1.0.5. Um, it doesn't matter as long as you've got the um, Tone library installed. Um, then we should be good to go. And I actually, I believe that Tone is standard with Arduino as of like Arduino 1.0. So um, if you've got a newer version of it, don't worry about it. Um, let's see. I need, I told you to be prepared and I was not prepared. I need a mini USB cable so I can connect my breadboard to the computer. Um, I'm going to have someone find me one of those uh, while we're doing that. Uh, uh, hopefully, you can find yours and get plugged in. And if you've got a new breadboard and you haven't plugged it in yet, this will give your computer time to, uh, to install the drivers and everything. Really, I'm just stalling until we find a cable so I can get plugged in here. And if we have another question from the, from the uh, comments, I can take another question while we're doing that. <laughs> so, uh, in delivering this mini USB cable, um, uh, our, our assistant uh, videographer and, and uh, graphic designer, Nick, just did a, a full-on belly slide under the camera uh, to, to avoid being seen. And then I just spent, you know, like two minutes talking about it. So it sort of defeated the purpose, but it was really funny. And if we can get them to do it again, we'll catch it on camera. All right. All right, I've just plugged in my red board, and uh, we're, I'm installing the drivers right now. All right. So I should be able, you should be able to uh, go to tools in the Arduino IDE and go to serial port and see uh, a COM number that didn't show up before. If you're not, so I've only got one here. I've got COM9. Uh, if you've got more than one, you've probably got COM1 and then another number. The, the number that isn't one is probably your Arduino. But if you aren't sure, um, you can just unplug your red board, and then go back under tools. And whichever one uh, disappeared, obviously, is, uh, is the one that is going to be your, your Arduino. So I'll plug it back in, go to tools, and I'll select the one that I know is my board. And then uh, we'll also go under board, and we'll go ahead and select Arduino Uno, uh, which is what uh, which is the version of the bootloader that we have on the red board. So as far as the Arduino program is concerned, uh, the red board is an Arduino Uno. So go ahead and click that. So we have our uh, workspace set up. And uh, we'll go ahead and open. Uh, we're going to write this sketch from scratch. But I like to start from uh, examples, basics, bare minimum. Uh, and that'll give us sort of a template for writing the Arduino code that's going to um, control our, our theremin. It pops open a new window here. And you can see it's, it's, this is the bare minimum amount of code that you need to upload to the Arduino to make it do anything. And uh, actually, what it does is nothing. It just puts on a loop that sits there and, and, and does nothing over and over. Um, but it's got two functions here, the two that you need for any Arduino sketch. It's the setup function and then the loop function. And so uh, we will start by, let's see. Let's start by setting our pin modes for each of the pins on the breadboard. So we know that we've got two analog inputs, and we've got uh, one digital output. So we'll go ahead and set pin mode. And we know that uh, A0. So analog inputs are always going to be inputs uh, as far as Arduino is concerned. You can set it as a digital output. 
Um, but Arduino will assume that it's going to be an input. I like to go ahead and explicitly put that in the code so that if someone comes along later and wants to uh, change the code or use it in a different hardware setup, um, they'll know what I was using that pin for. I'm going to do the same thing for A1. And actually, just to keep things straight, uh, let's go ahead and make some, um, let's see, let's make some variables here for these pins uh, so that we can name them something else so that we can sort of keep track of them uh, throughout the code. Um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, let's not define, let's do, let's just do some, uh, Yeah, we can do define. I forget how you do this now. <laughs> um, shoot. Mike, I've forgotten how to do, uh, what, is the, what is the syntax for define? In Arduino, pound define? All right. Define, uh, actually, Arduino doesn't uh, interpret define like, uh, like it would a variable. Um, it actually just changes all of the, everything in your code from the define down. It, it swaps that out before it even compiles the code. Um, so I like to use defines for things like pin names because um, it's a little easier to deal with. Oh, here we go. Put in, yeah, I can do that make this easier to see for people. All right, there. <clears throat> so I'm going to make a couple of defines here uh, to change uh, the names of these uh, pins so that we can keep track of them in the code. So we know that uh, A0 is going to be connected to our infrared sensor. So I'm just going to uh, name that I'm going to name that uh, sensor IR. That's a pretty self-explanatory name. And that's uh, A0. And if my syntax is wrong, uh, then you know some of you are going to be yelling at your computer screens right now. Um, and I'll find out when I, when I compile, and then we'll fix it. <laughs> uh, and then A1 is, of course, going to our potentiometer. So I'm just going to uh, change, I'm going to just call it knob 1 in our code. We'll do, uh, that's A1. And then down here, instead of using A0 and A1 in our code, we'll use those names that we just made up. And then uh, pin 9. We know that pin 9 is going to be our output. That's going to be our, uh, our tone pin. Um, but instead of declaring that as an output using pin mode, we're going to actually uh, put that into the setup for tone. Uh, just to give you an example of how to use the tone library and to make sure I have it installed on here, actually, uh, I'm going to find our sketch in here that uses that. Wait, does tone come standard with Arduino 1? Yeah, here we go. So under uh, examples, digital, you'll see uh, a number of sketches called tone keyboard, tone melody, tone multiple, and then tone pitch follower. Let's just click on tone keyboard. See what we've got here. <laughs> All right, and you'll see. Um, that they, they've actually kind of complicated this a little bit by putting in uh, a header file that has a, a series of, of notes here. Um, it's, it's basically um, global constants for this, uh, for this program. You don't need those. Um, the reason they did that is I, I suppose to link the uh, frequency in hertz to the name of the note. Um, since we don't care what note we're playing, we just care about changing the note, um, we're going to just throw the, the frequency in hertz as a, uh, as a variable to the tone 
um, function call. So um, we don't need that header file that links the note names to the, to the frequencies. So really, the only important thing that you're going to get out of this sketch is uh, it shows you how to use the tone function, which is built in uh, to Arduino now. And uh, it's a pretty simple function call. It's actually just tone and then the um, pin that you're going to play the tone to, and then uh, a comma, and then the note. And the note is actually going to be uh, your frequency in hertz. So uh, 440 is a middle C. And then, uh, or a middle A, middle C. And it goes up and down from there. So a uh, lower frequency, obviously, is a lower note. Higher frequency is a higher note. Uh, and then you can put a duration after that in uh, milliseconds, I believe. Um, we're actually just going to leave the duration uh, uh, blank in our function calls so that the tone will play until we call a different tone. And I'm going to take. Uh, uh, that line of code, and I'm actually going to copy it out of this and put it in my sketch um, just because I'm lazy. Go back to bare minimum here. And I'll put that in the loop. Of course, uh, we don't need any of that. And we know that our tone pin is going to be pin 9. So we'll go ahead and put 9 right there. And after that, uh, we can put the frequency of the tone we want to play. We don't know what that is yet, because uh, we're going to get that number from our infrared rangefinder. So let's go ahead and read the input from the rangefinder, and then we'll be able to pop that into the uh, tone function call as the frequency. So let's go up here and make... Uh, we'll need a variable to hold that number when we read it from the sensor. So let's go ahead and make that a, a global variable, uh, which means that every function in the sketch can access it. Uh, and the way to declare a global variable in Arduino, of course, is to just declare it before setup. So um, it'll be an integer, so we'll do int, and we'll just call it, uh, we'll call it freq for frequency. Um, and we'll go ahead and set it equal to zero to start. And then down here, we'll get our input uh, from, the, um, from the infrared uh, uh, rangefinder. So we'll just do uh, an analog read, which is a function built into Arduino to read from the ADC. Oops. Analog read. And we're going to read sensor IR. And we need to put that somewhere. And we made, uh, we've already made a variable. So we'll put, uh, we'll do freq equals analog read sensor IR. So now every time this piece of code runs, it takes a reading from the uh, rangefinder and it puts it into this variable that we've created. And that's going to spit out a number. Uh, actually, it's hard to say. Uh, what that's going to look like. Um, and uh, you'll want to know what the output of that sensor is before we, before we write this so that you know what to map that to. So we're going to use a function called map that takes the range of that range finder and turns it into a range of notes. Um, and in order to find out what uh, numbers are coming out of that sensor, we can actually go ahead and uh, add a couple lines of code here and use uh, the serial line to read those numbers and put them on our screen real time, and we'll see what they look like. So under setup, let's go ahead and put in serial.begin9600. And then down here, we'll do, uh, we'll do a serial, whoops, make sure you capitalize that S, serial.println for print line, so that's a print serial print followed by a line feed so that you're not uh, putting all these numbers on the same line. And we're just going to print that variable that we've just written. And then under that, let's put a delay, well, maybe a 100 millisecond delay, just so that we're not overwhelmed by the numbers that this thing's throwing out. And we'll try uploading that to the Arduino. 
this is sort of the moment of truth. We'll find out if uh, some of our hardware works at this point. All right, it says done uploading. So go to tools and go to your serial monitor. That thing is huge. Let me. There you go. And uh, if you're not seeing these numbers spitting out here, either you've got a problem with your hardware, uh, but go ahead and go down here and make sure that this says 9600 um, because that's what we typed in our code. Um, and make sure, if that says 9600 and you're still not getting these numbers, um, then you may have made a mistake uh, in your hardware and you want to double check those connections. Um, but it looks like I'm getting what I would expect. Um, I'm going to turn the sensor so that it's facing the ceiling here. The ceiling should be well out of range of uh, well out of range of the sensor. And uh, you see, aside from a few minor blips, uh, I get mostly like stuff below maybe 20. Um, it's hanging out around two. So that's good. That's the low end. That's uh, as far from the sensor as you can get. And then I'm just going to sort of move my hand closer to the sensor. And you can see as I, as I uh, sort of lower my hand down over the sensor, uh, the numbers are rising. And they top out around, you know, it looks like around 5, maybe 550, 570. I'd call, I'd, we could call that 600. So we'll say the numbers kind of vary between 0 and maybe 600. So I think that's probably a good functional range uh, to use in our sketch. So go ahead and close your serial monitor. And of course, you may get numbers slightly different from this, but uh, they should be about in that range if you're using the same sensor that I am. So I'll close that window. And uh, we may need these serial uh, functions later. So go ahead and instead of deleting them, just comment them out. You can do that by putting two forward slashes uh, in front of them. And they'll turn gray like this. And that means that uh, it won't interpret those lines of code when it goes to run them. We'll get rid of that there. And uh, go ahead and group that delay in with the, with the serial call here. OK, so now we know that this number uh, frequency uh, after this function call is going to be a number between 0 and 600. Uh, 0 hertz, obviously, isn't a note. That's not, you're not moving any air. Um, so there's not going to be any sound there. And 600 is still a relatively low note. That's some, it's not a low note, but it's just somewhere above, sort of above a middle C. Um, and so that's not really a great range for our instrument. We, we'd like a little bit more dynamic range in our notes. So we're going to have to find some way to take that number that, that ranges from 0 to 600 and turn that into a number maybe centered around 440 with, with a couple hundred on either side. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a function called map that'll take one group of numbers and it'll map that range to another group of numbers. And so I'm going to, uh, and what map does is it, um, you're going to want to put that into a variable. And you, what we'll do is we'll do freq equals map. And so uh, what this will do is it'll take whatever's in frequency, we'll map it using the map function, and stick it back into that same variable so that we don't have uh, a whole bunch of variables in our sketch and get numbers confused. And so the, the variable that we're pulling from is going to be called freq. And then here, we want to put the range that we're mapping from, so the numbers that we expect to see. And that's going to be 0 to 600, as we just figured out from uh, the serial monitor. And then the range that we're going to map to uh, is actually totally up to you. Um, knowing that 440 is going to be sort of a middle, a middle C, like a middle note, uh, you can go way higher than that. Of course, uh, high pitch sound is going to be pretty annoying. Um, and then, whoop, I've got an update here. Uh, and then uh, too far below that, and you actually won't be able to hear it. So uh, sort of just pick a range. I'm, I'm going to go maybe, let's call 200 hertz to 1,000. I think that's probably a pretty good range. We can adjust this later if we want to. We could even use maybe the other potentiometer to adjust that range. So uh, I think that's probably good for that line of code. And that'll give us a frequency that actually relates to a note that we could hear. 
And now uh, let's go ahead and make our call to the tone function so that we can actually play that tone. Um, and I'll just paste in that, that call from, uh, from the other sketch, the tone keyboard sketch, and get rid of this whole piece here. And we know that the tone is going to be played on pin 9, because that's what we connected our speaker to. And uh, the frequency for that is going to be this variable that we've set up to hold the number for the frequency. And uh, I've just left the duration entirely off of that function call, because I just want it to play that same note until I tell it to play a different note. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll uncomment this, uh, this delay, maybe make it a little shorter, but uh, just kind of give it a little bit of space there, maybe 20 milliseconds. This is entirely arbitrary. I'm just making this up, but I think that'll work fine. And now we've got uh, sort of everything we need to make noise. Obviously, uh, our linear potentiometer isn't part of the mix yet. Um, uh, but this is everything we need to sort of get uh, sound from our rangefinder to our speaker. So let's go ahead and upload that and see how that works. Uh, if you don't hear anything, you should hear some pretty awful noise as soon as this is finished uploading. If you don't hear anything, uh, adjust your volume knob. You may just have the volume turned all the way down. Oh, uh, yeah. So there's some awful noise. And uh, the next test is going to be make sure it relates to the rangefinder. I'd say that works. It's kind of counterintuitive, uh, kind of want the note to go up as your hand goes up, but we could do that if you wanted to. Just flip the last two numbers in the map function call, and you could in get the inverse of this. I think this is probably a pretty good range of notes, so I'm going to uh, leave this how it is, and we'll get, the, um, we'll get this, this linear potentiometer in the mix. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and turn that volume knob off. And then we'll go back to the Arduino uh, environment here and write a little bit more code. So we know that we have our knob on A1, and we've called it knob1 in the sketch. So let's go ahead and create a variable where we can hold the value of that. So I'm going to set up another integer variable, so int, and then uh, let's just call this, um, this is a terrible uh, name, but we'll just call it val for value. Uh, we know that this is, or we'll see val1 for value 1, value of knob 1. And we'll start that out equal to 0 uh, just to initialize it. Um, but what we're ultimately going to do down here probably right under our first analog read, is we'll do an analog read on knob 1 and put that value in there. So let's go ahead and do val1 equal analog read knob1. So now uh, we have a value in there, and we know because we set up this voltage divider between 0 and 5 volts that the range of this value will cover the entire range of our, um, of our ADC, which goes from 0 to 5 volts. So that'll be, uh, so the minimum will be 0, and the maximum will be whatever the maximum value of the ADC is. Um, uh, in this case, we'll get a value between 0 and uh, 1,023. Uh, so we want to go ahead and use that number to do something, do something to change the sound. In the uh, one that I built for the promo video, I used that value to change a delay between when the note, when it reads a new note in from the sensor, and it gives you sort of this quantized uh, sound where it, the, the note changes at different intervals, so you get either a really fluid uh, up and down uh, of the tone, or you get this sort of computery, jittery sort of change. And uh, that's a very simple thing to program, so we'll start with that, and uh, if we have a little bit of time, maybe we'll, we'll tweak it and see um, what else we can make it do. But for now, let's go ahead and just 
this delay that we already have in here, this 20 millisecond delay, let's go ahead and just change that to val1. So instead of delaying for 20, it'll just delay for however millisecond or however many milliseconds uh, uh, is is stored in that variable. So that's the only change that we need to make for that knob to work. So let's go ahead and upload that. And we're done uploading. So let's turn the volume knob back up so we can hear what's going on. That's pretty good. So what I'm going to do is uh, just kind of change this. You can tell the, uh, that knob must be turned up to like almost the maximum value because there's about a second between each note change. So go ahead and turn that knob and make sure that it's having an effect on the sound. Yeah. So as you can see, um, the changing, turning this knob actually changes the, uh, the delay time on the sketch. It gives you a little bit of a change of the, uh, the way that the instrument plays. So I think this is probably pretty good. Um, we could map this to a, to a smaller range of values because you almost never want to turn this all the way to a full second delay. Um, but I think this is, this is probably fine. This is about the level of functionality that we have in the demo that I built for the promo video. And uh, this kind of gets you off the ground. So um, in the interest of, of getting everyone finished on this project, let's go ahead and put this into an enclosure. We'll try to leave the USB port accessible when we put this into the enclosure so that um, uh, you can get in there and reprogram it later if you want to. So go ahead and unplug the mini USB. And then, uh, because we don't want this thing tethered to the computer forever, let's get batteries involved. So here's our uh, four AA battery holder with the barrel jack already installed. And I'm just going to throw these uh, AA's in there. This is a great way to power the uh, breadboard. Um, it's inexpensive. Uh, AA batteries are easy to come by. And at uh, six volts for four uh, AA batteries, it's just enough that uh, going through the voltage regulator, there's enough drop off there that it gets to f it gets to uh, it can get to five volts. If you put five volts in at, on this voltage regulator, uh, it is a low dropout regulator, but there, uh, there's just enough that you don't want to give it exactly five volts. You want to give it a little more than that. So six volts is perfect. Um, another thing that'll work is a nine volt battery. Uh, we have a 9-volt battery connector that has a barrel jack as well, and that works great. Um, but in this project, I like this because you can plug this into the barrel jack, and then you can, you can uh, either glue or tape your breadboard right on top of the battery pack, and it, it makes a little platform there and kind of keeps everything uh, uh, in one place. So I, I like to use the double A's. So now I've got double A's in here, I actually... I think I'm going to hot glue my breadboard to the top of the of the AA battery pack. This is where things get a little bit uh, sculptural. Uh, you can you can interpret this any way you want to. Um, I've just got a bunch of wires hanging off of my Arduino, um, and I'm going to try to fit it all into that pumpkin that I showed you earlier. So um, you can do this any way, any way that floats your boat. But I'm going to start with a little bit of hot glue. And actually, while the hot glue gun is heating up. Uh, I'm going to put this to the side and start looking at the possibilities uh, inherent in, uh, in uh, styrofoam pumpkins. So this is our festive uh, Christmas pumpkin, I guess, um, that uh, I'm going to, there, there is no real obvious point of ingress here uh, to introduce the Arduino, so I'm going to have to cut a hole in it. So I can get to the, uh, so I can get our synth in there. And I thought I had, I thought I had a knife, but I don't have a knife. Maybe one of my, <laughs> one of my beautiful assistants can give me a knife. Oh, look at that! All right, we've got a box cutter. It's no pumpkin carving knife, but I think it'll do the trick. 
I'm not 100% sure what this is made out of, actually. It's some kind of foam. Uh, it should cut easily. I guess we're about to find out. Um, if you've got like a, like a creepy doll or uh, like a plastic box or something that you're going to embed this in, go ahead and get that, uh, get that out and start hacking on it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just cut a, cut a big hole in the back of this, I think, is probably the way to, to start. This may not be the ideal tool. Oh, that's working okay. Yeah. I just want to cut a big enough uh, hole in the back of this that I can get the uh, I can get the Arduino in there, and then uh, and then I have some room to work uh, because I'm going to have to sort of get my hands in there and, and be able to, to to position things. Try to cut a good clean shape. Don't. This is, don't cut toward yourself, cut away from yourself. I'm setting a terrible example. Always cut away. If the knife slips and you're cutting toward yourself, you're gonna, you're gonna cut a big gash in your hand like I did. Uh, but here we go. And one more cut here and we should be, uh, we should be in. There we go see what we're dealing with. Oh, okay. All right. You probably can't see inside there, but it's, uh, you know, it's hollow and it's, uh, it's made of foam. So it's perfect. Um, I bet that hot glue gun is probably warmed up by now, so I'm going to go ahead and glue my red board to my battery pack here. Don't touch hot glue either. This is this is a bad thing to do as well. It's, it's very hot, as the name implies. Go ahead and throw a little bit of hot glue on this guy. And there we go. Now is probably a good time to plug in your battery pack and make sure that it works. There it goes. Whoop. It works. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start planning kind of where all this stuff is going to go in my enclosure. What I'm thinking is I can probably put uh, I can probably put one of the knobs in the nose of the pumpkin. And maybe I'll put the maybe I'll put the the sensor, the IR sensor, in the mouth here. I think is probably a good spot for it. And uh, there's a nice round hole here. I don't know. If, I think it was uh, for a, there's a light bulb that's stuck in here, so you could plug it in and light it up. Uh, I'm just going to put the speaker there. I think that's probably a good place for the speaker. And then we've got the volume knob. Maybe the uh, maybe I'll put a knob in. let be pretty macabre if I put one on, on in each eye. So I think that's probably the way to go. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and and kind of try to fit everything in here. Uh, I'm just kind of. Here we go. Now, uh, if you've chosen a, if you've chosen a, a pre-made enclosure for your project, then you probably found yourself in a similar situation to me, where you're going to be working in tight quarters here uh, for a while. I may have not cut this hole big enough to get my hands in there to work on this. Be really embarrassing to get my hands stuck in a pumpkin uh, on live internet. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm just going to try to I'm going to try to position the infrared sensor first. I think, kind of in the mouth of the pumpkin. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm I'm, us I'm using this box cutter. 
as a, uh, as a stick to push the infrared sensor to the front of the pumpkin. Hopefully I can grab it through the, uh, through the mouth here. Get it facing the right direction. I hope that, uh, that you're struggling as much as I am uh, to get your project into your enclosure. Um, and if you have any questions at this point, or if you're, if you're trying to catch up uh, with the rest of us on this, on this project, and you, uh, you missed anything and you, you want me to reiterate, uh, feel free to ask those questions in the, in the comments, and, um, and they will either be answered or they will get to me to be answered. Or if you just have any general spark fun questions, uh, you know, keep them PG, but, uh, but I will answer whatever questions you may have while I uh, <laughs> while I mount these electronics into this foam pumpkin. All right, I've got a got an infrared sensor sort of positioned in the mouth area of the pumpkin at this point. Uh, and I'm going to fix it with a little bit of hot glue, I think. That, that hot glue cool a little bit and I'll show you uh, where I've ended up putting this, this sensor. I think it's going to work out. You know, it occurs to me what I could have done is just cut, you know, like if you were <laughs> carving a real pumpkin, could have cut around the, uh, the top here, gone in from the top like a pumpkin, but uh, <laughs> instead I've cut this little window in the back. <laughs> Terrible. Um, although it, 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 is a, it is really thin on the inside, you can see sort of the thickness of the material. If I'd cut away the top, it probably wouldn't sit on there right. I'd probably have to like glue it back. So um, that's my excuse. All right, there's my, there's my infrared sensor in the mouth of the, of the jack lantern here. Uh, and now I'm going to move on. I'm going to try to get these potentiometers sticking out of the eyeballs here. I'm going to make this little window a little bigger so I can get my hand in there. Really wish I had a better cutting tool, but this was what was close, close by. Does this have a lock? Can I lock this? Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. All right, I'm gonna do, I don't know which one I've got here. This is probably the volume knob. No, this is the, this is the delay knob uh, in this eye here. I'm gonna put a little hot glue on that, keep that in place. the hot glue might start to melt the foam this pumpkin is made out of, but it seems to be working really well. It might be melting it a little bit, but I think that's probably, probably helps more than it hurts. This is pretty sloppy. Let's 
gonna look great. Hold that in place while the hot glue sets up. I use a uh, high temperature hot glue, so it takes a little bit longer to set. Um, but I find that it's it's often a lot stronger than the low the low temp stuff. That's just about dry. And in the meantime, I'm going to get this other one in position. Uh, this is terrifying. This is real creepy. We really missed Halloween by, uh, by a long shot here, but this would have been perfect. I want everyone to know the pumpkin was an, a, like an absolute last second choice, um, and it's great. Education department was nice enough to let us have this pumpkin. I did have to ask them in the form of a song. They asked specifically that I sing my request. All requests to the Sparkfine Education Department are now to be sung, or they'll be ignored. So I did that. If you could all just sort of, uh, if you could comment, if you're watching, if you could throw a comment, just let us know if this is weird enough, if this is getting weird enough for you. But it's cringing every time you pick up the knife. Oh, the knife is terrible. The kni this, is, uh, this is one of those breakaway uh, box cutter knives. It's a little Stanley pen knife situation. This is not mine. I don't like these at all. I don't like this. Someone handed this to me because it was on the... I swear I'm holding it for a friend. Uh, someone... <laughs> this was on the table over there, and I know uh, I'm trying to cut away from myself and cut down, never up towards myself. Um, not always achieving that, but... Um, yeah, don't do that. Don't use this to carve foam, and don't cut towards yourself. Um, stay in school. Stay in school, you know, <laughs> study, all that. Yeah, no, I understand. I'm, uh, you know, do as I say, not as I do, is what I'm saying. So do that. <laughs> Let me introduce a little bit of hot glue here just to... Hold this other potentiometer in place. Yeah, we got a question. Let's see what we got. De Devin Larson, Devon Larson. De I'm probably Devin. I'm messing up your name. Uh, asks, what's the difference between ceramic and electrolytic capacitors, and which one is better? Um, the answer to which one is better depends entirely on your application. Um, uh, the difference between ceramic and electrolytic, uh, they're, so they're made of, of different materials. As the name implies, uh, an electrolytic capacitor is actually made up of um, either sort of rolls or plates of, of, um, of a material that sit inside of an electrolyte bath. Uh, like a like a salt water bath, it's a t it's a type of electrolyte, um, and and it, so the name actually refers to the construction of the capacitor. The uh, whereas a ceramic cap is not it's not electro it does it's not full of an electrolyte. So an electrolytic cap, for instance, may be something something you would see on a circuit board that's kind of uh, I don't have one, but it's kind of shaped like a little can with legs sticking out of it, uh, and if you uh, if you hook one of those up wrong, or you squeeze one with a pair of pliers, uh, it, you'll, you'll get a little bit of fluid that comes out of it, and that's the electrolyte. Um, and often they'll be scored on top, so in case you do pop one, uh, uh, it won't sort of blow up and destroy a bunch of stuff on your board. Um, uh, so you can actually tell really, really simply by looking at them which one is which. Um, as for which one is better, uh, again, um, 
it really depends on what your application is. Um, often ceramic caps are going to be smaller than electrolytic caps, um, but they have different uh, properties as far as uh, maybe what the signal will look like on the other end, how fast they sort of drain off a charge once they've um, once you've built one up. Um, I wish I could answer that question better, but um, but it really does depend on your application. Oh right, we actually do have a, a pretty good uh, video on on the different types of capacitors, and um, uh, and sort of the differences between them made by one of our uh, engineers, Sean Heimel. Uh, if you go on our, uh, you're already on our YouTube page. So if you look for a video, wh what is the video called? It's called Bust a Cap. Um, you, you can see the difference between some of the capacitors and. Uh, and Sean will even blow up a couple of them so that you can see what they look like when you, uh, when you put a large voltage reverse polarity on them. Um, so that's actually a lot of fun to watch besides being informative. Um, at this point, <laughs> I've got some potentiometers. Are we going to get festive? Here, throw that, throw that over here. Here we go. Hold on. Um, someone from our marketing department just threw me this hat. <laughs> with the instruction to put it on. So I'm doing that. It'll go on the pumpkin eventually. Everyone calm down. All right. <laughs> um, so we've got potentiometers. I've got the potentiometers in place. I've got my infrared uh, rangefinder in place. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the speaker fixed in place somewhere here and then um, we'll be in, in business. I guess the, uh, the idea here with the Santa hat is that since we missed Halloween by so far, maybe I can make this a Christmas pumpkin, which isn't a thing. It could be a thing. If everyone made Christmas pumpkins, uh, maybe we could start, maybe that's a thing now. Maybe we could start that. Christmas pumpkins. Um, so I'm just putting a little bit of hot glue around the face of the, around the outside of the speaker here, trying not to get it on the, on the speaker cone itself. And then put them into the pumpkin here so it's facing out of the little, the hole that was already here. All right, and I'll just do sort of a last scan here for, uh, for wires that might be uh, loose. It looks like we're okay. All right, I'm going to plug it in. Yeah, here we go. All right, a couple finishing touches. Let's unplug the power, because that's, uh, well, let's just turn the volume down. How about that? Um, we've got our goes to 11 knobs. We'll throw those on there. Uh, I will need a small flathead screwdriver. Um, here's a tip. If you have this set, this is, a, I actually really like this. Um, I think we still sell this. It's a, a set of different uh, driver heads for a sort of a simple uh, screwdriver. Um, but the problem that I have with it is sometimes if you put too much force on it, uh, the driver head will actually slip into the handle. Um, so I like to take the, the extension and, and just go ahead and put that on there and just push it all the way in and tighten that on, and that way you can put basically as much pressure as you want on that, and it's not going to move. Um, so if you have this set and you don't already do that, um, give that a try, because, um, man, that just made things a lot easier once I started doing that. I'm going to use a small flat head to back the, uh, the set screw out of this knob a little ways so that I can get it onto the potentiometer. 
and uh, I'm going to turn it all the way. I'm going to turn both of these potentiometers all the way to the left, or all the way uh, counterclockwise, um, so that I know what position they're in, so I can position my dials accordingly. I'll probably, since I know they're all the way down, I'll go ahead and put zero at the top, or one, I suppose, at the top. That's that's pretty good. That's probably that's probably gonna work fine. And then go ahead and tighten the set screw. Oh yeah, this looks great. I'm gonna do that with the other one here. Back that out. Put one at the top. And then tighten the set screw. Uh -huh. All right. Put this to the side. Get festive. It's a Christmas pumpkin. All right. <laughs> I haven't seen this, but everyone else in the room is laughing. Uh. <laughs> oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> and it's done. So, uh, turn the volume knob here. <laughs> Maybe we can play uh, like a like a jingle bells. Hold on. No, <laughs> we're not going to be able to play jingle bells. <laughs> the answer is no. There you go. Jingle bells. So that's a uh, so that is a finished optotheremin. Uh, I chose to do mine in a in a uh, festive Christmas pumpkin <laughs> enclosure. Um, hopefully yours is working at least as well as mine is. Um, if not better. Um, let's see what where are we here? If you have any questions, uh, I can answer a few questions before we wrap up uh, Spark Fun Live. Uh, I'm looking over at our comment moderator, and he's got a big grin on his face. So it's hard to say what you guys are saying in the comments right now. Uh, oh, uh, we are going to try. So uh, hopefully you've enjoyed Spark Fun Live. This was our first ever. Now I've got fuzz everywhere from this hat. This was our first ever Spark Fun Live. Um, we're going to try to do another one in two weeks. So if you want to build another project or if you didn't get to follow along this time, uh, then definitely uh, we'll keep you updated on when the next one is. But uh, two weeks from today, hopefully, we'll do another one. Uh, and you'll be able to follow along. We'll post a wish list ahead of time with the materials that you'll need so that you can get that stuff in and you can be ready to follow along next time. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done so so far, and that way you'll be able to uh, stay updated whenever we post a new video. And of course, uh, this video will be available to view um, uh, when, when this broadcast is over so that you'll be able to go back and watch uh, earlier parts if you missed something or if you're trying to catch up, or if you didn't get to follow along today and you want to go and get the wish list parts uh, now that you've seen uh, how cool this is <laughs> and make your own later. So. Um, again, uh, thanks for watching. I hope that you have a working uh, synth on your side, and we would love to see them. So if you want to post a video response to this video and show us your uh, uh, synth working and sh maybe play like a, like a festive melody on it, uh, then we'd love to see that. Um, until next time, uh, uh, I'm Nick. This has been Spark Fun Live, and uh, we'll see you in uh, two weeks or so. Five, in three, two, one.